My name is Kali Kavnis. I'm the co-founder, president, and chief operating officer of Crusoe Energy Systems. And today I'm going to tell you a story about turning fireballs into bits and bitcoins and the surprising environmental opportunities within such an improbable sounding idea. So I've come to this climate-themed TED conference hosted at MIT and the New England Aquarium to ask you to raise your hand if you like the climate credentials of these two industries, oil and Bitcoin mining. Not a lot of hands. Well, that's probably not a surprise given that this is a crowd with a lot of environmentalists, a lot of climate advocates who are wired to be skeptical of energy intensive industries. Uh, but today I'm going to tell you about an environmental opportunity at the intersection of these two very different industries and how one climate problem is actually solving another. First though, I'm going to take a very big scary risk in this crowd and I'm going to share right up front that during my career, I've been an explorer and producer of oil and gas and I've also been a Bitcoin miner. So I'm, I'm waiting for the booze to start and so, to dodge a flying shoe. <laughs> I was waiting for the, you know, the booing and the flying shoe, but you might be kinder to me than I'd feared. And environmentalists do have reasons to throw shoes at both the oil industry and crypto computing. Uh, both have very notable environmental impacts. In the case of the oil industry, we continue to wastefully flare about five trillion cubic feet of gas annually in big open flares uh, like the ones that you see on the screen. And crypto mining is famously energy intensive. Uh, we, all, we often forget that it's one of many types of energy intensive computing that makes up a much larger data center industry that consumes 690 million megawatt hours of electricity annually. What do these figures mean? So that gas flaring is enough to power two thirds of Europe's electricity if it could be captured. And those data centers are on track to eat 8% of the world's electricity by 2030, with crypto mining representing a small but very fast growing chunk of that total computing demand. And although I've been an oil producer and a Bitcoin miner, maybe it's fair that you withhold judgment and uh, shoe throwing for, for just a second, because I'm also an oil producer who was educated in the environmental idealism of Middlebury College in Vermont and I became very concerned about the waste and unnecessary emissions of an otherwise very necessary industry that my family has operated within for three generations. And as a Bitcoin miner, I became concerned with where and how power was being sourced for crypto computing and data centers more broadly. Applications with a huge promise matched only by their huge appetite for power. So the company that I co-founded in 2018, Crusoe, is on a mission to solve these problems of energy industry waste and computing industry demand by better aligning the future of the climate with the future of computing. And throughout my career, I've been a speaker, writer, and advocate for pragmatic environmentalism in the energy industry. So flaring is a long-term problem of oil production, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. A byproduct of oil production is natural gas. Natural gas is a hydrocarbon like oil which happens to have been baked a little bit more thoroughly underground, breaking the long liquid molecular chains into smaller gaseous molecules. So oil and gas are therefore almost always found together in a reservoir. When oil is produced in remote areas, it can be transported by truck or rail to a market. Um, but the only practical way to transport gas is in a pipeline. And if gas if a gas pipeline is not available or sufficiently large, or if there just isn't a market, which is very common in stranded oil field locations or remote oil field locations, then the default is that that gas goes to flare, meaning it gets burned wastefully, incompletely in a giant open air flame. And flaring is not a localized phenomenon. As this chart shows, it occurs all over the world in different proportions, in different absolute volumes, but it does occur all over the world. And up to 20% of the world's oil is produced in association with a flare. Considering that the COVID lockdowns of 2020 reduced global oil demand by an average of about 10%, we can understand how politically unrealistic uh, and immoral and uneconomic it would be to shut off up to 20% of the world's oil to solve flaring in that way. 
Global flaring volumes are so large that they can actually power the entire Bitcoin network eight times over. In fact, global flaring volumes are so large they could power all data centers on Earth if only that flaring gas, that waste, could be captured and harnessed effectively. And wasted energy is just one problem with flaring. The bigger issue to climate observers is that flaring does not fully combust methane. On average, 9% of the methane that goes through a flare escapes directly to the atmosphere as leakage called fugitive emissions. And methane is such a potent greenhouse gas that the methane escaping from a flare causes more than three times of the warming than the 91% that gets combusted into CO2. The chart on the right shows that over 20 years, methane escaping from flares is fully 72% of the total greenhouse impact of the flare. It's by far the largest climate factor. This is true because methane is 82 times more powerful than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. In fact, methane emissions have been responsible for 30% of the man-made global warming since the Industrial Revolution, a problem that is increasingly prioritized by policymakers, regulators, and investors. So this is why everyone says they want to reduce flaring, but fewer have made meaningful progress on the problem. The orange line here is showing the number of signatories to the World Bank's zero routine flaring by 2030 pledge. So these are 80 signatories that are governments of, of, of national governments or major multinational oil producers that are saying they want to reduce flaring and eliminate it by 2030. But the red line shows actual flaring volumes, which have been more or less flat for a decade and leads the Environmental Defense Fund to state in a recent report that despite commitments to reduce natural gas flaring, 2021 saw a net increase in flaring emissions. So at this TED conference and many other environmental summits around the world, there's increasing discussion of net zero by 2050. So what would the oil industry need to accomplish to enable net zero by 2050? To hit that goal, oil producers need to cut methane emissions by 76% by 2030. 76% in, in seven years. That's a huge technical and economic challenge, but it's a necessary part of the industry's overall goal to reduce carbon intensity by 57%. Combined with large volumes of carbon capture infrastructure, these cuts would put us on a pathway to net zero by 2050. But raise your hand, who thinks the oil industry can reduce methane emissions by 76% in seven years? No hands. I can share from personal experience that the oil industry is changing very quickly and it is taking this issue of methane and flaring seriously now, but I agree. New technologies and new approaches are needed if we want to come anywhere near these goals. And maybe you think this whole conversation doesn't matter because oil's going away. It's being replaced by renewable energy, right? Unfortunately, the recent history in Ukraine has proved just one more time how essentially human society depends on oil and other hydrocarbons. In fact, oil is today our single largest source of primary energy on a global basis, and the United States Energy Information administration projects that oil will continue to be humanity's number one source of energy through 2050. Renewables are growing very quickly, but total demand is growing even faster as billions of people come out of poverty around the world, meaning that hydrocarbons are needed to fill the gap until demand plateaus. In fact, the U.S. government projects that oil demand will still be rising, not even yet peaking by mid-century. Everyone talks about energy transition, but what is likely happening over the next three decades will be more aptly described as energy addition. In that context, if humans will continue to depend on oil for decades, if not generations, then flaring will continue to be a persistent climate problem unless we deploy technologies and innovations to solve the problem. And flaring is just one of many climate challenges that we face. Another key climate risk is going to be data centers. Data centers are rapidly consuming more and more energy each year. 690 million megawatt hours in 2021, with about 17% of that total computing demand coming from crypto mining. Despite the often chaotic volatility of crypto markets and tech markets in general, clearly the underlying data center infrastructure is growing in energy appetite, on track to consume more than 8% of global electricity by 2030. Where that power comes from, is going to matter a great deal vis-a-vis -vis our climate goals and outcomes. So five years ago, my co-founder who studied here at MIT, Chase Lockmiller, uh, he and I asked the question, can one of these problems solve the other? 
Can we better align the future of computing with the future of the climate by capturing wasted energy and methane emissions in the oil patch to power the booming demand for power in the data patch? And as we got underway, we also realized that there's a growing amount of wasted renewable energy, which is a story for another day, but has also become a, a key part of our business. Whether it's flared gas or curtailed renewables, the question we asked was, could we deploy data centers at an industrial scale to soak up this stranded energy and solve environmental problems? And it turns out the answer is yes. Meet digital flare mitigation, a technology pioneered and scaled by Crusoe. Modular data centers deployed directly into the oil field to consume otherwise flared gas at an industrial scale. It works like this. We tap into the gas line feeding a flare and capture that otherwise wasted gas to fuel a generator, which are the seven big boxes you see on the background. The generator produces electricity that powers high performance data centers to power computing applications like AI model training, graphical rendering, Bitcoin mining, scientific research. That happens in the 14 modular data centers you see here in the foreground. And all of this infrastructure is modular and movable, deployed and operated directly in the oil field adjacent to the flares. The solution is very scalable, as you can see from this image, where more than 2 million cubic feet of gas that was otherwise being flared is no longer being flared at this site in the Bakken oil field. Today, Crusoe operates flare-powered data centers like this throughout the oil fields of the United States and soon internationally. At Crusoe, we've reduced emissions with digital flare mitigation by a lot. Remember that I told you that 9% of the gas that goes to a flare actually escapes to the atmosphere. Crusoe deploys technologies called stoichiometric combustion and catalysts, which is just a fancy way of saying that we fully combust methane and clean our emissions to the maximum. In fact, we achieve 99.9% .9 combustion of methane, which we monitor through regular emissions testing. This reduces a flaring site's greenhouse intensity by 69% compared to continued status quo flaring, and also massively improves air quality by eliminating VOCs and other smog forming compounds. In total, we've prevented more than 4 billion cubic feet of gas from being flared. And we're operating at a run rate of about 20 million cubic feet per day, generating more than 100 megawatts of flare powered computing from otherwise wasted gas as we speak. Today, the avoided emissions from digital flare mitigation is about 800,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year, equivalent to removing 170,000 cars from the road through the elimination of potent methane emissions. This impact wouldn't have been possible without the support of more than 300 passionate and mission-driven employees, as well as investors willing to take a big risk on a new approach to flare mitigation and methane abatement. In total, we've raised more than $500 million of equity investment from technology funds, climate tech funds, and VCs. So we need to decide which emissions pathway we will travel. The challenge is real. The status quo of stated policies and pledges puts us on track to significant warming the century and a carbon concentration ramp that is nearly unmatched throughout most of the geologic record. The flip side is that humanity continues to depend on hydrocarbons for most of our energy, and likely we will throughout the lifetimes of everyone in this room. To move from the orange and red lines closer to the yellow and green lines, we need mitigation technologies and innovations that can scale quickly. Digital flare mitigation is one such innovation, an economic solution to methane emissions from flaring, which helps to extend the climate runway and buy time for renewables and nuclear to scale to the point where they really can support the full demands of society. So I have two parting thoughts for you. First, over the coming months and years, our society and policymakers will debate how and where to source energy for intensive computing applications like AI and machine learning and crypto computing and more as data centers become a key driver of global electric demand. Regardless of what you think of those applications, is it a crypto winter or not? Is it the future of finance or speculation? Is AI the future of all industry or is it Skynet or is it just an overused buzzword? Regardless of your view, compute workloads are clearly going to be a bigger and bigger part of our economy and our energy system over time. And it is appropriate that we should ask the hard questions about where that energy for computing will come from. The first idea I want to leave behind here is that there are versions of energy intensive computing that are not a negative for the climate. In fact, there's a proven approach that eliminates flares, 
reduces methane emissions, scales, brings value to stranded energy, and soaks up waste. Computing is actually a climate opportunity, not a risk if we deploy it thoughtfully. This is a nuance that has been poorly understood until now, but you can make sure that this idea spreads and is reflected in the decisions and rules we make as a society about how and where to source energy for computing. Second, I have a message to any aspiring entrepreneurs and innovators in the crowd today. In the earliest days of Crusoe, before we had a client or a project or a product of any kind, I remember pitching our concept to a potential partner, someone who I was very hopeful would embrace the idea and give us a chance. And this person told me something that I'll never forget, which was, no version of this will ever work. And that was an understandable reaction to a pitch about converting fireballs into bits and bitcoins in remote oil field locations. But what was once a crazy idea is now reality. And it is eliminating huge amounts of methane emissions. It is employing hundreds of passionate workers throughout the United States and soon internationally and providing the lowest cost and most climate aligned computing infrastructure to new and important industries like AI, machine learning, and digital assets. If you have a big, new, crazy sounding idea, you need to know that your path is going to be full of skeptics and haters and roadblocks and maybe some flying shoes. So if you care enough about your idea to make it your mission to bring that idea to life, you're gonna need to ignore and block out the skeptics and the haters and the roadblocks. Keep pushing forward, push forward and push past all of it and you will get there in the end. And this outlook has actually become a motto at Crusoe. The obstacle is the way. By pushing through the challenges, solving the problems and overcoming the setbacks, you create a moat and a competitive advantage. It's a moat of discouragement and adversity. It's a moat that turns away and stops 99% of the others, but not you. Thank you very much.